Hello, welcome to NDTV and BQ Prime. I am Neeraj Shah. Crisis create opportunities, and no one in calendar year 2023 would probably suggest or talk or or kind of amplify that point more than Rajiv Jain of GQG. His bets into Adani Group at the height of the Hindenburg saga have paid off handsomely, as this graphic shows you. And I think the idea of uh, requesting him to come on air today and talk to us about his thoughts around. this whole saga around india around the whole investing piece uh, is to actually draw some lessons about how the man who manages such a large pool of money across the world thinks about this very basic tenet in the first place rajiv great having you thank you so much for joining us on ndtv and bq prime lovely having you it's great to be here okay yes. i want to i want to start off with the with the hot topic of course and which is uh, this um, Adani Group bounce back both on the markets as well as on the judiciary side. What do you make of it? So yeah, so I think I think I would say that we were not exactly surprised. We thought that a lot of the things that investigating has been investigated before. Uh, obviously, it's kind of becoming a political football more than uh, more than real economic substantive issue. Uh, that was our view. In fact, uh, we bulk of the addition that we have done, which I have reported now. uh were done before the supreme court verdict we have not really done much after the verdict and on a cost basis we have probably 2.3 2.4 billion dollars given take invest in the group now so we did add uh you know over the last 2 to 1 3 months now our view is that that what we are buying is uh, an entrepreneur who has done a phenomenally good job in execution look india is a very difficult place to execute a lot of these complex infrastructure projects we have some we have seen some meaningful failures over the years i mean whether it's the mumbai airport the 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 the, the mumbai transmission distribution assets um uh, green assets by softbank they exited so many others have exited or they're not profitable so on and so forth so we think extremely good execution I've met the management team over the years and I'm, I'm nothing but impressed uh uh, uh and, and the second part is the thrust from the government uh to roll out infrastructure and these projects will go who can execute i mean you can't simply give it to people i mean if you look at the power crisis of 10 years ago what happened i mean so many people failed we're seeing that in bawde by the way in green assets too uh as interest rates have gone up a lot of these assets would not be viable and there's some fairly well known marquee shops so our view is that we were getting fantastic assets at very attractive valuations then um less less attractive valuation now by the way i have to say because the stock has popped a little bit um and 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 the and the supreme court issue is in my opinion kind of pretty settled i mean look i mean they got completely clean clean shit i mean uh, and 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 you know i mean uh, the the somebody had an opinion uh, about stuff and we had a different opinion uh, we have to do our own work i'm just i'm just surprised how little uh, attention has been paid on the long term execution long term growth story uh, and 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 what has been delivered I mean, that's 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 real yeah well in some sense rajiv you would be a happy man that the street reacted the way it did because you've told before in multiple interviews that you don't like to pay up you like to buy things at a good value and you got the chance uh, just that clarification rajiv uh, that you uh, you obviously just told me in this conversation that you all the purchases that you did in the adani group stocks was done before the supreme court verdict came out and not after that even though you are on record that uh, if i'm not wrong that you want to be uh quote and quote the second largest shareholder in the group after the family and you would want to participate in the future offerings from the from the group yeah i'm, I'm glad you clarifying because uh the market value with the market value I mean, the stock might go down tomorrow who knows so we have around 2.3 ish plus minus 100 million uh invested in the group various group companies okay uh and and bulk of there's always because we have dozen dozen clients there's always some buying and selling that happens any given day uh because of inflows and outflows which we don't control uh but so from a substantive perspective well the buying was pre supreme court uh and 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 we do intend to participate in the fall on offering which will be primary issuance because that is for the growth opportunities that they have so we do intend to participate there in in, in a meaningful manner uh, we are not looking to intend to buy the market here and now so we have no intention of chasing any of these here uh, uh you know in, in what what the market will do what the market will do yeah there is there is a thought rajiv that uh, infrastructure assets per se don't make money if not the assets themselves then when they are listed in india well 
history is replete with examples of these companies not having made money. I would love to understand from you when you think of infrastructure assets and your large investments into the Adani Group. I mean, you have investments elsewhere too. There is ITC, HDFC. There are other names that have come about, and I'll talk about that. But just one question on the infrastructure assets valuing. How do you think about infrastructure in India or general infrastructure asset investing? Because the street seems to have a completely different view, so to say. Yeah, so uh, the infrastructure investing tends to be a little bit different than your consumer staples, IT service, so on and so forth. Uh, there's a long gestation period. Uh, you have to invest up front. You get regulated rate of return. They have to be by definition leverage. I mean, there's nothing like unlevered utility, regulated utility. That animal doesn't exist. Okay, it never existed before. So the notion that lever, anybody says utilities are levered. Okay, you know that's fine. It's just an opinion, not investing that, but you could get very predictable returns for a very long term. So let me give you an example. If you look at, for example, um, next era energy in the US, which is considered by any uh, sort of astute observer will say that is probably the best utility in the US. But, uh, uh, and actually happens to be out of Florida, Florida power, they originally called Florida Power Light. These guys are seven times debt to EBITDA uh, and it's triple B minus, okay? That's triple B minus versus US, you can argue is pretty much triple A. Uh, I think, uh, you know, to triple A or double A plus. You, in the, uh, Adani Green is triple B minus also, but India is also triple B minus. So Adani Green is the same rating. So that's that's in the rating issues. But from a debt perspective, the way you get paid is if you're getting, let's say, mid-teen uh, return uh, IRRs, uh, once you've invested in those, over time, the earnings certainty is very, very high. And hence, they can sustain high leverage. Now, Adani is kind of unique because they are in a very strong investment phase even now. And what we've seen, for example, in ports, and ports is a very good uh, sort of uh, 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 case study, that after certain years, you will see a hockey stick of earnings come through. But you are in the phase of, uh, you know, sort of building that out. It is not like IT services, you, you, you turn on, you know, you turn on the tap and, and revenue start coming in and you become profit. Just a different business model. There's nothing right or wrong. So from that vantage point, a lot of these businesses have uh, the free cash flow will come through later on as they keep investing. In fact, we don't want them to free cash flow positive. Uh, and, if, uh, and on the debt side, we feel that, and, and, that and, and my view has been, they should not be cutting too much debt. To be very clear, the, the incremental capital that they're raising is for growth. India has ridiculous TAM, if, if, if I'm going to call that, because you're basically competing with, uh, with, with state-owned companies. I mean, look at the state electricity boards. I mean, who, want, who wouldn't want to compete against them, right? I would love to com compete against them if I could. Um, I mean, talk about the most inefficient players you, you, you get in India, the, but it ain't easy. I mean, we saw the Reliance Infrastructure in Mumbai. They, they, they couldn't cut it. I mean, GVK basically had to sell airport during COVID. So somebody said that how come the asset values have gone up, the airports have gone up? Well, if you buy airports in the middle of COVID, it'll come cheap, right? It was, it was basically shut down. So these infrastructure assets have a very long tail. The returns are regulated by the government most of the time. Uh, after the initial setup, you get very steady at return. So to grow, you have to keep investing more capital. So they're always free cash flow negative. But you get very high returns, right, on a long-term basis. So you get 20, 25-year visibility. Which is why we feel that most of the Adani infrastructure uh, companies that invested, we actually not betting on, uh, we are not taking any economic cyclicality uh, risk also in these cases, which you are in other cases because you know they, 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 they you know they, they will earn ir almost irrespective what happens to the economy uh, in in a certain way. In, in which case, Rajiv, you would be happy if a large portion of the street is valuing infrastructure in the way that it does and talks about the high debt levels, which in some cases is justified as well. But in the ones that you made an in investment, you'd be happy that the street thinks of them that way because you can get them at a good clip at a price that you want because you are really investing into them or thinking about them from that long-term mindset, which the street might not be thinking about them. Exactly. And I think I think the little bit of disconnect is not a bad thing, right? So, I mean, frankly, the stocks have gone up is nice, but I mean, it's, I'm not perfectly happy because because in the following offering now to pay a higher price is like, you know, who wants to pay a higher price? I mean, it's nice if it went up, but I mean, you know, we would have participated in a meaningful way in, in the following offering. Yeah. Because the opportunity set is ridiculous. Sure. I get uh, that and, and nobody has executed it. If, if you look at the laundry list of failures infrastructure side, uh, because you have to make sure you have access to capital, long-term stable capital, right? I mean, in India, 
is it's hard to get long term uh, uh, sort of stable access to stable capital. I mean, that's that's an issue. Um, uh, but the thrust of the government has made a big difference uh, in, 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 in making this possible. Got it. Just one more question, Rajiv. I mean, because you would have seen episodes like this happen, uh, that there is, but this was too swift, wherein the, the fall was very large, and then the recovery has been swift. What does this do to, you know, an, a global investor's view about fundraising uh, intents of, of, of a group like Adani Group? Because they have announced the intent to raise funds. You said you want to put in money, but I'm just trying to understand from a global investor's perspective, you reckon fundraising with all that's happened now and the Supreme Court committee uh, verdict coming out and well, that it'll be smooth sailing. Yeah, I mean, look, I think, I think, I think, uh, I mean, uh, to be clear, uh, if others don't invest, it doesn't bother me. In fact, uh, I, I like the fact some index funds are selling because allowed us to buy some stuff, right? Sure. I mean, that that's as dumb as close to dumb money as it gets. I mean, I don't understand a short seller rights report and why are, why is MSCI reducing waste in the indices? That is, some of this is totally nonsensical. Uh, but but look, if, if people weren't doing stuff like that, we wouldn't get an opportunity to buy either. Uh, and I'm not trying to be arrogant here, but but I mean, there, there, there's some there's some um, mandatory selling that happens when indices reduce weights, right? Yeah. So I I don't see a problem in their their ability to raise capital at all. Yeah, uh, and no arrogance, as you said at the start of the interview. Some people have their view, and you have yours, so which is fine. I'm just trying to ask you one last question here, Rajiv. Uh, you made a, a call uh, which made headlines. I'm trying to understand what was investor behavior uh, into your funds post that because you are a large fund. Now, uh, how how did your large investors uh, present then or potential which have may have come into your funds post then uh, react, behave, ask you about? Can you talk talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So. Uh, uh... Because the, the, it, 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 there were a lot of headlines that how our investors react. And the interesting is that first quarter was probably one of the best quarters in our history. I believe the third best, best quarter in terms of inflows in our history, GQG's history, which is not a long history, by the way, it's eight years. But but you had $5 billion on net new money in, in, Ma, in, in, in first quarter and $2 billion plus in March alone, right? So, uh, so I mean, this has been extremely well received uh, because because a vast major investors, by the way, even especially sitting in India, there, there was this narrative without looking at looking at the assets and, and the quality of execution that some of these have governance issues. And the more work we did, in fact, it's interesting that if I look at the total amount of work we've done on the group, we've probably done more work after the deal, more than 50 work after the deal than before than 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 we had at the time of the deal. So we kept working on these names, which is kind of how we operate. We have a position, we're working on it, and if you like it, we increase it. If you don't like it, we reduce it, right? That's how we think about it because we, you, you, you can't, you know, you, you learn over time. And as we spend more time, we actually like it more, not less. Uh, so, and, and that's been the same response with our, with, 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 you know, with our, with our client base. It's been extremely positively received. Okay. And 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 would okay. So and would that be the view of people for your interest in India as well? Because you have a fairly large uh, portion of your total assets, I presume, in India as a destination. Now, India is a sinusoid of multiple eyes because of geopolitics, because of diversification, etc. But from an investor's perspective, uh, how do you see India? How do your investors talk about India? I would love to understand that. I think I think there's still a disconnect. I mean, everyone talks about India is expensive, and I said, look, I'm investing in India for I don't know 28 years. I've never heard India is cheap, uh, uh, and and the reason is because there are two types of markets. One is more cyclical markets. We tend to sell at low valuations. I mean, uh, Russia was before it basically shut down for us, uh, or China. A lot of companies are cyclical, or in India, you got a lot of cyclical and low valuations, and we own some of them, for example, right? We own some of the steel companies. Uh, we, we like Coal India, for example, right? Um, uh, those tend to sell at lower valuations. But if you look at growth businesses, and India has a lot of them, they tend to sell at higher valuations. That is no different. I mean, Accenture and Infosys are very comparable. They sell at similar valuations. How can you compare a Infosys with, I'm, I'm, I'm picking a name, um, uh, you know, uh, PetroChina in China? Uh, then they're not comparable. PetroChina will sell at different valuations. So uh, uh, we feel that the growth story in India is actually getting better in a much, much more robust way. So we have we have had significant exposure in India over the long run, but this is probably one of the larger ones. Uh, I don't know, we have over 13 plus, 12 and a half, 13 billion dollars, something like that invested in India, in very, very select group of companies. 
uh, we tend to very take a long term view and in the global context is still underappreciated because the pushback that oh india is inexpensive well the problem is you're comparing apples and oranges you you can't compare uh, um, uh, a semiconductor name with Infosys, right? Semiconductor name would sell lower values than Infosys. Uh, and we don't own Infosys, by the way, just, just yeah. for, for the record at this point. Uh, so so I think I think we feel that India will be differentiated, it will be diversified. Look, this administration has done a remarkable job of execution. I think that is the real important part of this. Uh, and that is accelerating growth in a big way. The banking system is clean now. Um, you know, the credit cycle, I believe, should be very robust. Real estate cycle, real estate cycle should be robust. So, if you look at our global book, this is probably one of the highest exposure in the global uh, in, a, in, the, in the global book in India. Wow! And 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 from from the from the looks of it, uh, maybe I'm presuming too much, but I presume that you are comfortable not only with keeping this exposure but increasing it meaningfully over the course of the next few quarters, as the case may be, if things turn out right and you get the right value. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, you, you know, the stars have to align a little bit, but uh, I mean, we have basically a kind of a dozen names and we have 13 plus billion dollars. So it's very, very concentrated. But our exposure, it's almost a given, it'll, it'll, it'll probably creep higher, uh, particularly if, if there's volatility. So we, look, we need volatility. I mean, steady, any kind of hard to execute. And, and by the way, even Adani, we, we kind of thought that once the Supreme Court ruling comes out, we may, have, we may not get our opportunity to sort of make sure we, we, we take our fill a little bit, right? So we, we did bulk of the buying free the Supreme Court ruling. Got it. Uh, so that, well, because that's twice the clarification that was necessary and which has come in from Rajiv Jain. Uh, now, Rajiv, uh, just a word on, on, on risk assets uh, at large as well, because this whole theory of uh, peak rates is now well and truly established, but we live in an interesting geopolitical world wherein news headlines around conflicts between the West and certain portions of the East are never ending. So how do you think of risk assets, both from a perspective of where rates are and where uh, the central bank's balance sheet and their ability to, or their desire to pump in money and geopolitics wedged into it? So um, we, we feel that there's a tectonic shift that is happening because of the war. Uh, there's a clear separation happening between East and West, so to say. Uh, and there'll be some winners and some losers. Like Europe, we believe on the losing side, US will be on the winning side, um, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and India would be on the winning side uh, because, because, because access to cheap energy is critical. Uh, Europe, uh, I mean, look, I, I don't quite understand this. They keep increasing sanctions, uh, but, but, but the energy cost is basically forcing industries to move outside of U Europe into United States. Uh, there's a the in the IRA bill uh, is uh, the Inflation Reduction Act as as called. Um, uh, uh, it'll be huge in terms of uh, sort of uh, revamping infrastructure in US. And we talked to so many corporates in Europe who said we have no choice. Europe is not big, is not competitive. You cannot operate a twelve thirteen dollar LNG versus let's say three four dollar pipe gas. You, a lot of businesses are not viable at that, right? So I think I think Europe is 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 in trouble. In fact, by the way, Europe. Europe, if you look at it, their per capita income has, has been flat to declining for the last 17, 18 years. That has never happened in the post-World War era. That's a real problem. So they've, they've made it up by increasing debt. So debt to GDP has gone up by leaps and bounds. Uh, uh, but now as interest rates begin to go up, it's a problem. So we feel like inflation is less of an issue. Uh, we were very concerned about inflation two years ago. Today, we are a lot less concerned. I think the trend is, the direction is heading the right way. Uh, the supply chains have normalized. However, the real growth problem in Europe, because they have, they're basically over-regulating it, right? And one thing we like about India is that this administration is deregulating deregul a lot of stuff. Like, I mean, if India has to grow, it has to deregulate and open up, uh, open a market, make, you know, either doing business matters. Um, and, and, and Europe is going the wrong way. So I think the geopolitics helps India, particularly cheap access to cheap energy. Um, and, 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 and U.S., um, you know, in, 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 in that mix. And this is a five-year view, not a two-year view. Got it. Rajiv, in, in just a quick follow-up in that sense, a slightly medium-term question, really, if indeed what you said about per capita is uh, dissipating in Europe, the fact that uh, export-oriented businesses have those challenges, and the fact that the East has countries where the per capita is growing, population is young, and therefore demands more, would domestic oriented companies stand a better bet of slightly medium term success as opposed to companies which are largely focused on exporting to the West? 
just trying to understand uh yes and no um i think i think uh, there will be unique challenge some export oriented but some of them will do very well too so i i, I wouldn't necessarily extrapolate it to export versus domestic it really depends by business and industry so on and so forth and look i mean at the end of the day what we have seen what i have seen over my investing career is that you are still betting on the jockey if you are you betting on smart entrepreneurs who have shown the ability to manage the local environment you're fine uh, uh you can you, you're not buying uh, you you you're not buying sort of a macro theme per se and 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 like i mean look at indian it service I mean, they've done a phenomenal job over the years and they, they they'll do just fine i mean we don't own them right now for 50 different reasons but but if i take a fight you know, i think i think i think they'll be fine so i think i think they'll do okay um over the long run but it's hard to say export versus domestic purely based on that just wondering what would be the 51st reason raji which might make you look at indian it companies since there are 50 different well, which you don't because of which you don't know yeah. uh, i think i think there's a short term headwind i talked about in march uh, that it services we are very concerned about most of the companies have had disappointing numbers after that um uh, and and i think the valuations are still a little bit on a higher side uh, the the uh, there's still some risk on the ai in the short run uh, in terms of the the demand supply side um i think the visa issue is going to be a little more problematic go forward these companies will manage all of that by the way but look i think i think our real issue is that we only have so much capital and we would like to run concert book we don't have to own everything true and 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 from a risk reward perspective those are kind of they are whole hum they 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 they're not juicy enough and maybe and as that i made my living trying to sort of make money of what what sort of passive passive funds do uh, and and a lot of folks are forced to own that we are not yep sure uh, last couple of questions, Rajiv. Uh, one is um, on on this whole piece around uh, ESG or the pushback that we are now starting to see, not just from companies but from countries as well. Now, where are you on this argument? Because I heard you make an interesting point about an Indian um, asset, which is also quote unquote anti ESG. Where are you on this whole ESG argument, and whether the multiples derate or whether they go up because the world may have no alternatives? Um. our view is that we want to own companies which are actually going to improve the world okay but to simply say no fossil is a little bit delusional uh in my view is anybody says no fossil or talks of banning fossil i mean unless you wear no polyester you use no plastic you 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 only use candle for for you know light and and live in the caves uh then obviously it's perfectly fine you need fossil um so some of these assets are being given away um i mean coal assets for example um uh, and 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 some you know some of those uh, some of those kind of businesses so our view is that we want own companies which have good governance good long term prospects uh and 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 be on the same side of the of the of the owners um so 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 we be happy to own them i mean people forget that was not that long ago coal india for example used to sell at i don't know 20 plus times earnings and it was called a compounder and now it's at uh, six times or 10% dividend yield right and and it's as steady as a business it gets and india does need coal Uh, there is no question about it um uh, so so uh, but but i think the energy uh, chain in general is very attractive from a longer term uh, and 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 be a significant energy investment by the way after not owning for almost 10 years anything in energy uh, i i i hate to say we had no energy uh, <laughs> but we had almost no energy investment for the longest time and last two years that's become one of the biggest areas of investment and we continue to look for opportunities in 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 those areas just one quick word on the other india piece because you mentioned about rattling the cage and what it does to business now that is with regards to one of your investments but you have large investments as you said at the start of the interview 13 or billion dollars if i'm not wrong there is itc there is hdfc i believe recently you guys exited the amc space and today morning or last evening your name has come a small one but your name has come into one purchase in the healthcare space as well talk to us a bit about your india exposure so um uh, i mean uh, We we try not to sort of show our tracks, right? So I was, you know, I mean, sometimes they, they, by regulatory reason, it has to be disclosed uh, because we have literally dozens and dozens of clients. So it's hard to sort of do a totality picture in totality how we are exposed. But I think it's few buckets that we quite like um, besides infra type businesses, and they are sort of some you know like cement type exposure and so on and so forth in that. But we obviously still like the banks. We do like some public sector banks. I mean, I talked about them. uh along with private sector banks we did not own public sector banks for longest time but we do like them now um and along with private sector banks that has been a sort of a 
core area for, I don't know, two decades now. I mean, uh, I remember meeting Aditya Puri, I don't know, 20 plus years ago, and that became a core position for the longest time, not to mention AGFC and so on and so forth. So, I mean, I think it first bought AGFC in 98 or something. So we wanted it for a long time. Uh, in, 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 in a big way from, from our vantage point. So we do like the finances a lot. There are some really fantastic management teams. And I'm talking about globally, by the way. I mean, some of these managed teams are some of the best in the world, I would say, whether it's developed markets or emerging markets, no question about it. Um, so that still remains. So if you look at infra type businesses, uh, financials, uh, those are two big. In staples, it's pretty much selective one or two names. We don't own some of the names that we used to own before because of the valuations and growth has slowed down. Uh, and, and the third one, a little bit in the healthcare side. Uh, we do like the long-term healthcare. I mean, obviously, one was disclosed, as you said. Uh, it's a relatively small position. Um, but but I think I think healthcare in general would be an attractive space over the long run. So I would say these would be some of the bigger ones today. We don't have anything in IT services um, type names. So Okay, yeah. And, but that's a pocket that the 51st reason if it comes about, would make you interested? Because you do like the companies, as I heard, just that the valuations may not be yeah. favoring you. Well, valuation, I think, I think this shorter term headwinds. headwinds. Uh, but, but it's also the, like, I mean, uh, a part of that is uh, we have to move capital around. I mean, I wish I could just own them and leave them. You'll be fine. But we have only 100% to invest, right? And it's not an India fund. So uh, we have significant exposure. So, so if I need to buy Adani, I need to sell something too. I can't simply keep adding, right? So, so, so that is how the capital moves around. What's the most bang for the buck you can get. Uh, and that's part of the reason that we thought there's much better risk for Adani than some of the IT services, you know, three, four months ago. And even, by the way, this is not a two-month view. Frankly, I did not expect them to rebound as quickly as they did. Uh, I thought it will take a longer time. Uh, and that's why we thought we, we'll have to sort of nibble, which we did over the last three months. Um, uh, so I think I think a lot of that is sort of risk-reward. Uh, so, so, see, if you look at the last 10 years, some of the steady AD businesses have gone re-rated quite significantly. Uh, those are the ones which are tough to call. Uh, they are very good businesses. Um, would they do well here on a continual basis and, and justify the valuations? That's tough to say. Um, there's, there's downside if you ask me, because if the earnings growth accelerates in areas that have struggled, infra, cement, those kind of names, I think they'll capital leave some of these steady eddy compounders that have been re-rated from 20, 25 times 10 years ago to 50, 60, 70 times now, right? I think I think that that shift could still happen. Okay, just one quick follow-up though, if you will, uh, allow me. Uh, the, the argument could also be that in a country wherein the per capita is moving from $2,200 to $5,000 at some point of time, and the population still is growing and is young, uh, the consumption of some of these uh, steady companies uh, where the valuations have grown might actually stay at elevated levels and keep the valuation levels higher. Uh, and therefore, why not those as opposed to taking a bet on businesses which may or may not necessarily succeed? Well, um, yeah, but look, I mean, you know, markets are cyclical and, and, and like human beings are mood changes, right? I'm going to be very unhappy in the morning and very happy in the evening. Uh, so, would, would these bills stay at 60 times? They've gone to 20 times before, from 60 times, by the way. I mean, I can give you ITC history. I mean, it was around 40, 45 times the early 90s, okay? And I remember in early 2000s, people pushing back that these things always say, they were eight, nine times earnings by the early 2000s, okay? This ITC, it went back to 35 times earnings, went back to 12 times earnings. So True. sentiment changes. Uh, so it's a relative growth, earnings growth that will matter. And from that vantage point, I think the advantage might shift to different areas. That's the call. Look, we may be wrong, but that's the call we have to make. My final question, Rajiv, uh, more a macro question of sorts, and which is around this whole concept of short selling. Uh, you know, in India, it was a big scare, probably the first real scare that uh, India saw on short selling. There may have been others, but this was the first real one. But the world has seen enough of it. Now, what are your thoughts here? Because some people say hey, they are vultures and some people say they are necessary for price discovery. So, I mean, the problem is when you're rattling a cage, like what happened, you know, in, in, in this case, uh, there is real business implications. So I do feel that that this probably will be investigated. And, and I wouldn't surprise if some of the banks uh, or, or players would lose access uh, to India. I mean, look, I wouldn't be surprised at all because, uh, because of what has happened. Now, uh, no problem with short selling. People short sell all the time, and that's probably fine. But to go out and rattle a cage sometimes can have business implications. 
uh, which can be you know which which may be problematic so i mean i think i think i think uh, short selling is fine as long as you're not sort of you know rattling the whole world around it that's my personal view um but but from our vantage point i mean i'm not complaining because it also creates the opportunity for us right so i mean like, uh, it's it's how do we make money otherwise as they say for a market to exist they have to be two opinions there's no market everybody agrees Rajiv Jain, such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you uh, for all those insights. Thank you for the clarifications and this whole piece around how to look at infrastructure was really good. So thank you for all of that. It's great to be here and good to talk to you, Neeraj. Likewise, and viewers, thanks for tuning in.